Applications of systems of linear equations. Polynomial curve fitting. For our first application of systems of linear equations, we're going to take a look at polynomial curve fitting. And what that means is that we're going to be given a certain number of points on the coordinate plane, and we're asked to determine the polynomial that goes through those points. This is not a difficult task for us to do once you know the process, and the process begins with knowing how many points you are given. So here we are given one, two, three points, and so we're going to model this with an equation one less than three, so degree of two. So we have three points, so n is equal to three, so we're going to use a degree of n minus one or two for our greatest degree. So notice I'm just going to write the polynomial. I'm going to have a constant term. I'm going to have a linear term and I'm going to have a quadratic term. In order to find my system of equations, I'm going to start with my first ordered pair, negative one eight. So I'm going to replace P of X, which is the Y value with eight. And I'm going to replace X with negative one. So that's going to give me a negative one here and a negative one squared here. So here's what that process is going to look like. P of negative one, I'm replacing each X with negative one, and then I'm simplifying. A one times negative one means minus A one. Negative one squared is positive one. So my equation, my first equation in my system of equations is A zero minus A one plus A two is equal to eight. I'm then going to repeat that process for 0, 4. So I'm replacing P of X with 4 and X with 0. So A sub 0 plus A sub 1 times 0 plus A sub 1 times 0 squared. That gives me my second equation, A sub 0 equals 4. And then my third equation, I'm going to use the point 2 comma 2. I'm replacing x with 2, and I'm replacing p of x with 2, and I get my third equation. So now I have a system of equations that I can write as a matrix. Now, I could either, from this point, I can either turn it into a matrix and solve using Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination, or I could use substitution or elimination algebraically. I'm going to use matrices. Um, so again, I've rewritten this as a matrix. And then from here, I'm just going to do all of those row operations. I'm going to flip row one and row two. Uh, I'm sorry, swap them or interchange them. Negative row one plus row two is row two. I'm not going to focus so much on the math here because our last two videos were very long and focused on the math on how to get this into reduced row echelon form. So through all of that math, I have now arrived at reduced row echelon form. Whoops, only there. Reduced row echelon form, which is 1, 0, 0, 4, 0, 1, 0, negative 3, 0, 0, 1, 1. What does that tell me? That tells me that A0 is equal to 4, A1 is equal to negative 3, and A2 is equal to 1. What is the equation of the polynomial? The polynomial is replacing A0 with 4, A1 with negative 3, and A2 with 1. So my polynomial is P of X is equal to 4 minus 3X plus X squared. I also want to show you something using Desmos. So desmos.com slash calculator is just a regular graphing calculator. And you can see I have a table containing the three points, negative one, eight, zero, four, two, two. And the equation that we just came up with, which was x squared minus three x plus four, or we wrote it as four minus three x plus x squared. We can see that this is a quadratic equation that does cross through those three points. A great way to check that is to enter this table, which I did by clicking on plus and then table. And when I click on, click and hold on that circle, I can click on lines. Now, if I click on line, it's just going to connect them with a straight line, but you can see it says add regression. And 
immediately it goes to linear regression, but this is not a straight line. We want to match this with a polynomial and we know that it's quadratic. So we're going to click quadratic regression and you can see it has now given me the equation 1x squared minus 3x plus 4. So this is a really great way to check your work to make sure that you did the work correctly when you did it all by hand. I have a similar question for you to try, and I don't want you to solve the matrix. I'm going to show you a way to reduce that matrix into reduced row echelon form without breaking a sweat. But what I do want you to be able to do is to write the system of equations and corresponding matrix for this particular question. So press pause, do that part of the question, and when you're ready, press play to see how you did. So to begin, we have one, two, three, four, five points. So we need to be using this polynomial. So a degree of four, and we can see we have up to a degree of four. And we're going to use those five points just as we did before to plug in negative two, set it equal to three, plug in negative one, set it equal to five, plug in zero, set it equal to one, plug in one, set it equal to four, and plug in two, set it equal to 10, and then write the corresponding matrix that looks like this. So hopefully you were able to get to that point by yourself. Um, if not, go back and watch that first example again for the step-by-steps on exactly how we found that. But again, this is the augmented matrix now that we're working with. Now, just as we did in our last video, we can certainly use the capabilities of Desmos to find those coefficients for us. Notice I've just put in those five points. If I long click on the circle, I can click on add regression. And again, this is cortic regression because it was to the fourth power. So I'm clicking cortic regression and it's giving me the solutions for my coefficients. However, quite often you'll be asked to find those coefficients as fractions, and that's not super fun. So I'm going to show you something else. Now, I caution you to only use this to check your work. So I'm going to go to not desmos.com calculator, but desmos.com matrix. And you can see I've already entered in the matrix that we came up with together. And what I want to do is find the reduced row echelon form of that matrix, which I called matrix A. And you can see it's giving me those same decimals. So take a quick look at those decimals. This would be the X to the fourth coefficient. So negative 0 0.70833 and so forth. And if I click back over, you can see that that's the same. Uh, but the great news here is I can click this little calculator and convert to a fraction. And now I could very easily write this equation um, with fraction coefficients and plug it right back in over here and see that it is going to be the exact same curve. So feel free to use desmos.com backslash matrix calculator or matrix for the matrix calculator but keep in mind that there will be times where I am going to ask you to show each row operation. Network analysis. Using networks is another great real world application to systems of linear equations. In a network model, you have to assume that the total flow into a junction is equal to the total flow out of the junction, and that helps us to set up our equations. So for instance, if I look at the first junction, into junction one is 20. Out of junction one is both x1 and x2. That leads me to the equation x1 plus x2 is equal to 20. And I'm going to continue that process, keeping in mind that the output should be in standard form. So for two, the output is 20 and x3. So 20 plus x3 should equal the input of x4. But I don't want to write 20 plus x3 is equal to x4. I want this in standard form. So x3 minus x4 is equal to negative 20 is the equation that I will use. And I'll keep that going for each of the junctions. So looking at junction three, I have 
in of x2 and x3 and out of 10 and 10 or 20. So x2 plus x3 is equal to 20. For 4, x1 and 10 are coming into 4 and x5 is going out. So again, I'm going to write that as x1 minus x5 is equal to negative 10 to write it in standard form. And finally, junction 5 has an input of 10 and x5 and an output of x4. So I'm going to write that as negative x4 plus x5 is equal to negative 10. This is the system of equations that I will use. Just as we did when we were looking at polynomial curve fitting, our focus with these applications is in how to set up the system of equations and not in how to solve them. That's what we focused on in lesson 1.1 and 1.2. So once we get to this point, I'm simply going to pop this into an augmented matrix and I'm going to use technology to come up with the reduced row echelon form. From here, I'm going to convert it back into a system of equations and isolate each of those variables. And I can see that each x1, x2, x3, and x4 all rely on the value of x5. That tells me this is going to be a parametric solution, which means I'm going to let x5 be t and write everything else in terms of t. Now, the important thing to understand here is that this means there are infinitely many solutions. Mathematically, what that means is there are many possible flows for the network, and all of those possible flows are determined by the value I set for t. So let me choose 10 as t. So if I let t be 10, then that means x1 has a flow of 0, x2 has a flow of 20, x3 has a flow of 0, x4 of 20, and x5 of 10. And mathematically, that works. I could also let t be 20, and I can see that those flows would be different, but it still works out in terms of the equation. However, because we're talking about a network, we're talking about a real life situation, we need to understand that network flow into or out of any junction has to be greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, excuse me. So I can't have a negative flow. So let's take a look at these equations and determine where it's not going to be okay to have a t value. So if I look at this value, negative 10 plus t tells me that if t is not at least 10, then I'm going to end up with a negative value there. So I know that t has to be greater than or equal to 10, and that occurs here as well. Here, t can be anything anything I want, as long as it's positive. So we'll say um, t is greater than or equal to zero. And t for x5, again, has to be greater than or equal to zero. And then for x2, 30 minus t, so I need 30 minus t to also be greater than or equal to zero. So that gives me 30 is greater than or equal to t. So t is less than or equal to 30. So what that tells me is yes, mathematically t can be anything that I want it to be, but in terms of this question, I have to let 10 be less than or equal to t be less than or equal to 30. Because if I say let t equal 100, then I'm going to end up with a negative network flow um, at junction two, and that's not okay. There's one more great example in your textbook involving electric network flow. Um, I decided to skip over that since the first two videos in this lesson were so lengthy. Um, but if you would like to look at that, again, the course text is Elementary Linear Algebra, Ron Larson, 8th edition. So coming up next, we're moving on to Chapter 2, Operations with Matrices.